I'm okay with it. What's that? Yeah. All right. Man. It's just so good to be with you in worship. I just, I don't know. That tremble song, that's new to me. That's really good. If we could just get that through our minds, that every time that we're facing something that is like feels too big for us, when the darkness feels too dark, like that we can't overcome it, and just to speak the name of Jesus into the situation, it just makes all the difference in the world, you guys. And so I just, if you're going through anything today, I just, I just pray that's where you're at. Like you're just, you're just speaking the name of Jesus into it. And that you're going to come out on the other side into, in a better place. When we just stick with God, everything works out. I just don't know any other way to put it. When we do what he wants us to do, everything just works out. And so I just pray that, that you would just continue down that line today. Um, let's just pray a little bit before we begin. Father God, I just pray for every heart and, and, and mind in here this morning that you would just be with us, that you would just wash us with your word this morning. God, that any wrong ways of thinking that we would harbor, uh, that those things would just be pushed aside and would be replaced with the truth that can only come from you. God, I pray the power of your Holy Spirit in this place, that you would work on our minds and our eyes and our ears, that we could understand and see and hear what you want us to this morning. God, that every, every person here would be receptive to what you want. God, that we would just take your truth and run with it. We would take it through all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Bear with me here. You guys remember last week? Okay. That's sticking in your mind, hopefully. We're going to talk about the same stuff today. Forgot to have stuff in my pocket for the sermon, so I got to get that out. So, Rich might have to click on it for me. Yeah. So, um, very serious topic to start off with today. Again, like last week, you remember the vehicle that we need, the ministry vehicle? You recall, right? Okay. So, um, just need to go through. This is my office, you guys. It's fine. You know, it's, it's okay. But it's... You know, it's just, um, it's, you know, it's, you guys say that it's beautiful, but really it's, it's inadequate. It's just not doing it for me, okay? It's just, we have to have something better. You know, a man of God, as dignified as me, better place to work than me. So, I yeah, just want you to be aware, uh, to make some upgrades, and I'm relying on you, I'm counting on you guys, and you're giving, Okay? I need, you to get, I need you to catch God's vision here. This isn't for me. This is from him, okay? This is our church, okay? This is what it started out as. Did you realize that? So when you look around you today, you know, this is version 1.0, um, but this is grossly inadequate, you know? We're just going to need something better than what we have here. You know, these chairs, these walls, the floors, it's just not, it's not good enough. So um, I'm modeling it after um, Donald Trump's Trump Tower. Have you ever seen it? This is what I think we need. <laughs> My office, you know, I just need a, I need a slight upgrade. The slate floors aren't good enough. I do marble. I think the marble floor to ceiling is really what we ought to have. It's just a proper place to do ministry. I think the Holy Spirit will move more in a place like this than in my office. And um, it's gold trim, so it's going to cost a lot. So I'm just going to, it's going to require a lot from you guys, but I'm hoping that you Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't naming names now, Chrissy, okay. They actually modeled it off of the uh, Palace of Versailles, and so I figured for the church, we could just go with the Palace of Versailles theme, replace all these lights with crystal chandeliers. That's right. Yeah, if you're going to serve a king, you have to have a palace. That's exactly right. Totally my point, Kim. And so... Donald Trump's building, his office there, or his house, uh, supposedly costs $100 million, uh, that whole deal. So, yeah, it's going to be pricey, but I believe in you guys. So if you could just put your faith gifts in the box, uh, we will begin our remodeling soon, okay? <laughs> Sorry. i got to start it off a little lighthearted whenever we're going to talk about money. Um, so we're going to 
Uh, we have one more week after this one, just talking about biblical finances, handling money God's way. And I just want to do a quick recap of last week. Uh, first off, um, what did we learn? You know, there's a few different points from last week that we learned. And number one is that it's all God's anyways, remember? Remember the parable of the talents? Whether you had five talents or two talents or one talent, they all came from the master. And so they, God doles out to us our resources, and we are just stewards, right? And so when we give, whether it's to someone else or to the church or whoever, we're not, we're not giving of our own money. We're giving his money that he stewarded to us. We're just moving it around, hopefully as he wants us to. Amen? Okay. Number two, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We found that from Matthew chapter 6. Uh, that's right out of the scripture, word for word. And so it's not that when we care about something, then we put our money there. That's how we think that it is. You know, we think that if we care about something, then we're going to put our money there. But it's actually the way around. Our heart actually follows our treasure. And so when we put our treasure in a place, then our heart will actually follow. And so if you're wondering why you're not more connected to the church or why, you, why your heart uh, sometimes seems to be in different places, it might be because you're putting your money in different places than it should go. And so if you want to be more connected to the church or you want to be more connected to human trafficking or you want God to change your heart, you know, like we talked about last week, we have the human trafficking um, houses in Greenville. That's part of our denomination. Like as soon as you begin to put your money there, I can guarantee your heart will be there a little bit also. If you begin to put your money into the church, then your heart will be more in the church also. And if you continue to put your money into the things of the world, like if I just go and buy guns and, and bows and arrows like I would like to, uh, guess where my heart's going to be? It's going to be more in my tree stand than it is in church. That's just naturally where I go. And when I buy a certain stock or I buy a certain mutual fund, then I tend to pay more attention to that mutual fund. My heart goes there with it. My heart follows my treasure. And so, and then lastly, this was our final point of last, last week. If God doesn't have your money, he doesn't have your heart. And this isn't about Living Water Church increasing their giving. It's not about anything like that. Um, this is just about you handling your money the way that God would want you to handle it. And so just understand my heart there. If you're new here, just to kind of prove to you that this is not it, uh, we're okay as a church. Like, truly, we don't need, we don't need anybody's giving here, honestly. Um, we're fine. Now, we can do more if we had more money, obviously. And the other part of this is none of us get paid. This is a 100% volunteer-led church. And so every dollar goes right in, into the church. Every dollar stays here. You know, we tithe our stuff, we give to missions, we do all those kinds of things. But it's not being spent on salary, it's not being spent on just kind of like building the machine, so to speak. Make sense? Okay. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And then lastly, we're not trying to get something from you, okay? That's not my goal here is to like wrench the money out of your wallet. That's not it. We're trying to get something to you. When we live our lives God's way, we'll be blessed. When we're obedient to what he wants us to do, he takes over. That's just the truth. And money is a big part of that. Our money touches everything, doesn't it? Everything. Everything. Okay. So how many of you have you ever felt like, um, feel like you're completely obedient to God with the way he wants you to handle your money? Okay. A couple of you halfway. Okay. Three of you are halfway there. Okay, great. How many of you feel like you've ever robbed God? How many of you feel like you've ever been tempted just to be selfish with your money? Yeah, okay, so we're all there, right? Um, that temptation, that pulling always is there, right? It's always there. Understand. So hopefully I'm going to give you a couple things today to, to help combat that. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Mark today. We're going to be in Genesis, uh, and we'll be also in Malachi, which is the name of my son been waiting to preach Malachi for a long time. I actually thought after he was born, I would do a whole sermon series in Malachi, and I've never got around to that yet, so maybe I will someday. So here's a story in Mark chapter 12, really interesting story. You've probably heard it before, um, even if you haven't been in church a long time. It says, Jesus, this is Jesus now, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and the poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. So you get the picture here? 
lot of people coming in, a lot of people well-to-do, put large amounts of money, and here comes this widow. She, she does have two pennies to rub together, and she throws them both in. That's all she's got. Jesus called his disciples to him, and he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she contributed out of her poverty. She has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And so it's really interesting. Does anyone have a King James Bible here? Does anyone even have a Bible here? I don't see any Bibles. What are y'all doing? What do you got? ESV? Okay. I need a King James. What do you got? Abundant NLT. Let me see this one. Let me just see what it says. You got Mark check. You got it? Hit me with the King James version of that uh, 41. You got it? Okay. Yeah, 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and the money that were with the casket. Great. And so the King James actually does a better job here than the ESV does. And that's rare for me to say, okay? So some of you that have King James Bible, you know, it's okay. You're good. We're okay with that translation here. But it says Jesus watched how they were putting their money into the offering box. He asked how they were doing it. And so that's a key word there, and it's actually in the Greek, that word how. And so the picture is that they would have this, they didn't have, um, they didn't pass around an offering plate, okay? They had like a big jar, and they would throw the money in there. And so if you had a lot of money to throw in there, then you would make a big show out of it. Like you could put it in there, and it would make some noise, okay? And so they were throwing in all their money, like me, like this is my tithe check this week, okay? It would be like if I was just walking, hey, everybody! In. Big time. Thing, okay? That's that's what it would be like. And here's the widow. She's got two coins, and that's her. Eric's probably by the amount that she give. I'm just ashamed. And Jesus says no. There's no shame there. There's no shame there. She's given more than everybody else because they gave out of their excess. They gave out of their abundance, but she gave everything she had. She gave everything she had. And so the first point here today is that the heart matters much more than how much. The heart matters much more than how much. God's after your heart. He's after your heart. And so... If you can only give $5 and that's what you got to give, if you can only give two pennies and that's all you got to give, that is fine. God is okay with that. He's after your heart. And so what's that look like for us? I want to go back all the way to the beginning here because I think these principles go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Um, really interesting to me. Um, reading through this this week and I was listening to another sermon and they were kind of going through this and it like, I had some ideas from before, and then this like triggered some new stuff for me, so I'm passing it along to you. It says, now Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel, and now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. And so she has two boys. Remember Adam and Eve? You guys know the story? The first two humans make the second, the third four, human and the fourth human. Okay, brothers against each other in many ways, and one becomes a keeper of sheep, one becomes a farmer. Make sense? You with me? In the course of time, came, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. And Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Why? Why was one offering accepted and the other rejected? Interesting. Interesting. And so, this is the rest of the story. The Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is contrary to you, 
but you must rule over it. And so God, there's two offerings. One is accepted and one is rejected. Cain becomes angry when his offering is rejected and, and God says, hey, there's something wrong in your heart. There's something wrong in your heart here. Sin is after you. Its desire is to have you. But you've got to conquer this thing. And so I would submit to you in our giving and our obedience to God, sin is always crouching at the door waiting to grab us. And it's up to us to rule over it. And so how can we do that? I got three things to point out to you about this scripture that I think are just really interesting to me. Number one, obedience. I think they knew what they were supposed to do. I think Cain and, it, and the way that God speaks to Cain, I think they knew what they were supposed to do. Look at look what God says. If you do well, will you not be accepted? It was almost like, hey, here guys, here's the right way to give an offering and here's the wrong way to give an offering. And Abel, you did well. And Cain, why didn't you, why didn't you do what I told you to do? Like there's an obedience there. And I think it actually goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 with the first sin. You remember what Adam and Eve did as soon as they sinned? They were ashamed and they, were, they realized they were naked. And so they took plants, right, and made themselves clothes. And God said, no, that's not good. That's not the offering. That's not the proper covering. And it says that God, God slaughtered an animal and actually made for them animal skins, loincloth. And so from that very first point, it was like the fruit of the ground is not the acceptable offering. It's the blood has to be shed in order for the offering to be acceptable. And my assumption is that Adam and Eve passed that on to their kids. And they said, hey, the offering from the ground is not acceptable. The one that's acceptable is to shed blood. And so here we are. Abel's is accepted. Cain's is not. And God says, if you, do well, if you do well, won't you be accepted? You see that? You with me? And so there's an obedience here. God wants us to be givers in a certain way. God wants us to make sacrifices in a certain way. Number two is priority. Priority. Cain, it just says he gave some of the fruit. Gave some of the fruit. Of Abel, it says he gave the firstborn of his flock. And so there's a priority here. When we give first, we're giving in priority. We're giving in honor, okay? You ever see that, like at a birthday party? Like who gets the first piece of cake? The birthday person. Why? Because we're celebrating them, right? We're honoring them. Like it's your birthday. Of course you get the first piece of cake. When we do dinners at the church, a lot of times we'll say, hey, if you're a guest, please eat first. Or if you're a mother with children, please come and eat first. And there's practical aspects of that, right? Because kids get a little crazy when they don't have food in them. But there's also other things that we're saying, hey, mothers, we recognize that your job is really hard here. We recognize that you should probably go through and get some food for your kids so that we don't want to make your job any harder. Amen, Mom? Yeah. So um, there's a priority. There's an honor that comes from, from getting the first things. And so God, he wants our first things, right? When we talk about the tithe, you ever learn about the tithe? Tithe literally means a tenth. And so a tenth of our income is supposed to go to God right off the top. It's supposed to go to the temple right off the God, right off the top, all the way back from, to the Old Testament. So you would take a tenth of whatever you earned first, before you paid any of your bills, before you did anything else, before you fed your family. Give that to God first. You made him a priority. You honored him with the first of your giving. And lastly, faith. Faith. When we give it the first, there's a faith that has to be involved there to make that happen. It's really apparent for Abel, okay? Because when you have animals and they're going to give birth to the first animal, that's the first time that you've actually gotten anything. Like if you have sheep, if you're not milking them or doing whatever and you're just trying to make more sheep, the first one, like birth, dangerous process, right? You can lose your animal in the process of birth. And so you get that first one and you're like, yes, yes, I finally got some return on my investment. And so then to take that, that first fruit, that the only thing that you ever get from that animal and to give it to God, you're really having a lot of faith, right? And saying, okay, God, I'm just going to trust you that you're going to give me some more animals out of this thing. Like this is the firstborn here, and so I'm giving it to you so that you will bless the rest. 
I'm going to give the first to you so that you will bless the rest. And for Cain, he just gave whatever he had left over. There's no faith in that, is there? Like, okay, God, let me take care of all this stuff first. Let me get everything sorted. Let me get all the bills paid. Let me do all this stuff. And then if there's anything left, I'll give you the last little bit. There's no faith there. There's no trusting there. There's just not. And so I don't want to be the guy that's giving God leftovers or nothing at all. I want to be the person that's giving God out of obedience, out of priority, out of honor, out of faith. I know that when I put my trust in him, he takes care of me. It's been true in my life ever since I started. And I started like the widow. <laughs> I can remember in my kind of giving journey, I didn't give God first fruits. I gave him leftovers. There's a way to there's a place to start there, okay? If that's where you got to start, then start there. It's better than nothing. But what I did, I was delivered pizzas on the side, okay? I had my regular job that paid all my bills and my savings and all that kind of stuff. And then I had my side job, which was pizza delivery. And that was like my fun money, okay? That was like whenever I wanted to buy something that I wanted, it was, it was about me, okay? Then that was what I used to buy what I wanted. And I felt like when I first started, I'd make like $40, $50 a week in tips. That was like what I really spent that was mine. And I started to give $20. And I was like, gosh, I can't even, I can't even consider how I give $20 a week. Like, that's crazy. Why would I give so much money to the church? Like, that's half of my fun money. And then the Steeler season would come around, and I'd make like 80 bucks to 100 bucks, and I started to bump it up a little bit, and then I gave 30, and I started giving 40. And then it's like, as I increased, there was a moment where I was making, I don't even, I wasn't making very much money <laughs> at my main job. And my boss called me in like a few months after I started just giving weekly, and he came in and said, look, um, yeah, I really want you to stick around for a while. I know you're not making that much money. I'm going to give you a raise of $11,000. It was insane. It was like a 40% increase of my salary. I was like, okay. How? Why? Like, it didn't make any sense. I didn't even ask for a raise. And he gave me this huge raise. It was this amazing blessing. And it was like the first time that I really, like, it kind of, like, clicked in my head. I was like, wow, I'm like starting to live my life the way God wants me to, and now here's this abundance. And then I, started, then I started actually tithing. Then I started giving him from the first fruits because I had so much there. But it started with just this like little step of like consistent giving, just consistent giving. And then you can ramp it up over time, whatever it is for you. Like I said, this isn't about getting money here. This is about getting something to you. It's putting your life into obedience to what God wants. I don't know. That's just my story, you guys. When we give leftovers, it's not a sacrifice either. When we give leftovers, it's not a sacrifice. That's why if we go back to the widow's story, she was sacrificing, right? She gave all that she had. She was trust. God had to come through for her at that point. There was no other option for her. She didn't have anything left. All the others, they gave out of their surplus. Abel gave a sacrifice. Cain gave what was convenient. You with me? Okay. Last scripture. Malachi chapter 3. It's a famous one. We're not going to go through the whole thing today. We're just going to go through a few verses. Verse 6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. That's pretty strong words, isn't it? Like, do you guys believe that God curses people? Like, that's... That's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? And I don't think that God is like looking at you and saying, oh, Tara, you didn't put enough in the, uh, 
in the box this week, you know, you're going to be on a curse now for the rest of the week. Hopefully you get it better next time. Like, I don't think that that's how he's, how he's operating, but I do believe that he set up a system, okay? There's a system in this world where when we are obedient to what he wants us to do, there is blessing in it. And we, when we are disobedient to what God wants us to do, there is cursing in it. All the way back to the Old Testament, we see that. And so just a few things to point out here. Number one, God does not change. From Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, to today, God is still the same God. He still has the same principles. He still has the same uh, rules and operations that he has called us to, to live in full obedience to him, to make him a priority, to honor him, and to have faith in him. Number two, he calls them to return to him, right? Obeying, trusting, honoring, and loving him. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. How easy for is, it, is it for us to get back on the side of blessing? We just run to him, right? We just run to him and obey what he wants us to do. And there he is, waiting for us to return. But they didn't do that. They kind of played dumb, it seemed like. They're like, what do you mean return to you? We're already here. And God answers with a question. Will you rob me? Will you rob me? Now let me ask you, God needs your money? No. Like you think in the... You remember when Jesus was going to go prepare a place for us? Like I just have this picture, like when we put an offering in the box, then Jesus is like, oh great, I got another sheet of drywall. And he starts like, he's like, okay, now we finally got some resources here in heaven. Now I can finally get this room finished off. Like, is that how it is? No. God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. That's what this is about. And so, when you're robbing God, who are you really robbing? Yourself. You're robbing us. When we don't give, when we don't follow the principles that God wants us to follow... We're robbing ourselves. So it says in our tithes and contributions. So we have a couple of things there. This is like your 10%, your first fruits, and then beyond. And beyond. Because it can become really religious, can it? Like we could say, hey, if you want to be a part of Living Water Church, Chris, yeah, I'm going to need you to see your tax returns last year, and then we'll make sure right at 10%. And it's got to be at least there, or otherwise, sorry. You know? <laughs> we never will do that. Ever, ever, ever going to do that. Because it's not, it can't be this religious thing either. There's no blessing in that either. And Jesus kind of changed the principle, didn't he? Said everything. Like it's not 10%. He rebuked the Pharisees for tithing everything down to the last penny and no more because they were greedy with the rest. Jesus said, isn't your whole life supposed to belong to God? Doesn't it all belong to God? Yeah, absolutely. So we have to be obedient in all of it. And finally, the curse. The curse. Not just one individual, but it was the whole nation. And so there's something at stake as a church, that as individuals are honoring God with the money that they have, with this, they're being good stewards of the resources that they've been given, then we're blessed individually. Church, if we could figure this out, we would be blessed as a church and as a city if we could figure this out. We could be blessed as a city and as a nation if we could figure this out. Wow. Can you imagine? All the resources that we have in the United States of America. Can you imagine if we really lived the way that God wanted us to live? What about at the government level? I mean, my goodness, $20 trillion in debt. How did that happen? By using God's principles? I don't think so. But it starts with us. It starts with an individual. So, anyways, hopefully you learned something. So these are the three things that I want you to take with you. Obedience, 
God has a way and a method that he wants us to live our lives. God has a way and a method that he wants us to utilize the money and resources that he's entrusted to us. We need to be like Abel and follow the instructions given and not like Cain and just go do our own thing. Amen? Priority. God should be first. God should be first. He should get the first fruits of your life. He should get the first fruits of the resources that you've been entrusted with. And he should get the first of everything, right? Like, isn't your day better when you give God the beginning of your day? Mine is. Instead of trying to give him leftovers at midnight, like I so often find myself doing, he, he needs to be the priority in everything. And lastly, faith. We should be giving sacrificially. If your giving doesn't cost you anything, <laughs> then it's probably not where God wants you to be. I'm preaching to myself here, you guys, because I can become very religious myself with it. And I can have this attitude of, uh, I gave my 10%. Now when so-and-so asks me for help, well, I already did my thing. And so when they ask me for help, then I struggle with that. I don't think that's how God wants us to live our lives. Now, there's still wisdom in it, okay? If I truly helped everyone in the way they wanted to be helped, everyone that asked me, I would have, my family would not eat. That's how many people ask me. But there's wisdom in following the Spirit in everything and being open to where God wants you to go, being open-handed with what he's given you, with the resources that he's entrusted to you. When we open our hands to other people with the resources that we've been given, it allows open hands for us to catch more resources that he's going to drop down on us. It's open-handed living instead of closed-fisted living. This is not good. This is not healthy. This is not the way God wants us to be, but open. Amen? This does not only apply to money. Every single one of these things applies to every other facet of your life, okay? What I miss? Okay. Absolutely, yeah. That's exactly where I was going to go. Thank you. So all these things apply to every, every other place in your life, in your relationship with God. God calls us to different things, right? And so we're starting a second service on Saturday evening, starting, in, starting at Christmas time. And so we have other spots up there for worship team members. We have other spots up there for a prayer team. Um, we can always use more kids, people, and first impressions workers and all, all kinds of different things. And so if God is calling you to something else, God is calling you into a different place of serving, God is calling you to a God is calling you to whatever, we need to be obeying him. God needs to be first in everything in your life. Be living as people of faith, following the direction of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So if there's anybody here that, like, if you, if I'm talking and you're like, you know, I've never lived my life for God. This is all news to me. And you are in a relationship with God, I would just encourage you, do not leave this place without talking to me or without talking to Pastor Mark or Pastor Luke or, or any number of people here. And we would all be happy to introduce you to the Savior because it's through Jesus that everything is possible. Like the only reason that I'm here today the only reason that I've been as blessed as I have is because I just followed some money principles. It's because Jesus came into my heart and changed my life. That's why I follow the money principles now. It's not like God gave, or it's not like I found a set of rules someday and thought, this is how I could get really rich. That's not what it's about. Jesus changed my heart. And I became a more giving person. And God has blessed more. Now I can be more. Amen? So if you want to be introduced to the Savior today, please don't leave here. Please don't leave this building without talking to me. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of it. Uh, God, these are hard topics. It's difficult to talk about, about money because it's so personal to each one of us. We all have different situations and different priorities and, and different things happening in our lives. And Lord, I just pray that you would take over all of those things. God, that you would build our faith as a people today. God, that if you're calling us to be givers differently than we have in the past, 
then Lord, I just pray that each and every person would just step out in faith, whether it's in giving to the church or whether it's to helping their neighbor or whether it's some other situation that, that we haven't even touched on today. Lord, that you would give them the faith to just take that first step on their giving journey to you. And Lord, I know that when they do, that you will be faithful, that you will be faithful to pour it back to them and entrust them with more resources. God, that when we're obedient to you, when we live in faith for you, when we put you first as a priority in our lives, that you then take care of us. God, help us never to trust in our money or to trust in our homes or in our cars or anything else. And Lord, there's so many people around us that are experiencing that this week that we can't even trust on the power companies, but that we can only trust in you. And so, God, we, we place all the resources that you've given us, and we place them in your hands, and we ask God, take care of us, bless us, so that we can be a blessing to the rest of our city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day, you guys. Have a great Thanksgiving. Um, don't forget to love on somebody here before you leave. And we'll see you next Sunday.